Good day, I'm Norman Wahlberger. In this video, which is sort of the highlight of this course on Boolean logic and applications to circuit analysis and propositional logic, we kind of address the holy grail of propositional logic. Going back thousands of years to Aristotle, the Stoics, and then to Leibniz, and ultimately to Boole. The problem of how do we mechanically systematize logical reasoning? How do we make it cut and dried, essentially mathematize it? Okay, so that's what we're accomplishing here with this algebra of Boole approach. So this is different from the classical propositional logic involving essentially Boolean algebra that's taught in courses around the world. This is a different point of view and we're saying it's more powerful and it essentially solves the problem in a way that the Boolean algebra point of view does not. Okay, so we are, are in fact going to be reviewing two different approaches to this problem. So two different resolutions of this fundamental problem. The basic one is to systematically depend on bool reduction. And the second one is to exploit the somewhat clever bool mobius transform. That's what I want to explain to you in this lecture. So we're basically reconfiguring the landscape of propositional logic. And I want to explain both approaches in the context of a very specific problem involving the illustrious knight Sir Galahad and his quest for the Holy Grail. So he's out for the Holy Grail and he comes to a fork in the road. There are three roads emanating. There's a golden road, there's a marble road, and there's a stone road. And in front of each one of these roads there's a guardian or a knight. And he talks to these knights, and here is what they tell him. The knight of the golden road says the following. This road leads to the grail. Also, if the stones take you there, so does the marble road. The knight guarding the marble road says, Neither the gold or stone roads lead to the grail. The knight guarding the stone road declares, Follow the gold and you'll reach the grail. Follow the marble and you'll be lost. Now, Sir Galahad knows, however, the crucial fact that knights are always liars. So, can he deduce which road to take to the grail? So, let's frame the information in terms of three propositions labeled G, M, and S. G states that the gold road leads to the grail, M states that the marble road leads to the grail, and S states that the stone road leads to the grail. Then in terms of those, we can express the information encoded by the statements of the knights. Remembering, of course, that knights are always liars, so we have to negate whatever it is that they're saying. Okay, so we have three premises. The first one, what the golden road knight said, turns out to be interpreted as, it's not true that the gold, gold road leads you there and that if the stone road leads you there, then the marble road leads you there. Right? So this is what the, the knight proclaimed, and since he's a liar, we have to put a knot in front of it. The second knight guarding the marble road uh, said that neither the gold or stone roads lead to the grail. So that's a lie, so we have to put a knot there, and the statement is neither the gold nor the stone roads uh, will lead to the grail. So not G and not S. And the third knight says that uh, the gold road will get you there, but the marble road will not. That's encoded there, and we have to put a knot in front of it because he's a liar also. Okay, so these are our three premises, and hopefully we can deduce one of these three conclusions. So it's not the case that we have one particular conclusion. We want to know which of these three conclusions, if any, is a valid consequence of these premises. It might be that several roads lead there, or it might be, in fact, that none of the roads lead there. We have to figure this out. Okay, so the first step is to take the information and convert everything to the algebra of Boole. Okay. We're not going to employ any sophistication. We're not going to start examining or thinking about 
the various premises and their uh, possible interactions. We're not going to do anything clever at all. Because what we want to do is we want to have a purely systematic or mechanical way of proceeding to solve problems like this and hopefully problems which are considerably more complicated. Okay, so the crucial thing is to understand how the logical connectives translate directly into the algebra of Boole. And I remind you that that's basically the algebra that we get with vectors of zeros and ones, where addition is component-wise addition mod 2, and where multiplication is component-wise multiplication mod 2. So it's really just a mod 2 kind of algebra on vectors component-wise. So, the things that we have to remember are that A and B, that logical connective, is translated into just the product. While A or B is translated as A plus B plus AB. A or B, that's like an inclusive or. The and here, the plus sign here, is an exclusive or. So that's how we go from that one to that one. The not operation, the inversion, is just adding one to whatever we have. A implies B is one plus the first term A plus the product AB. And if we have an equivalence like this, A is equivalent to B, that's the same as one plus A plus B. So hopefully these are familiar to you, so we have to just remember them. Okay, so now we're going to take the three premises and convert them into statements involving the algebra pool. So here's x, which is not g and s implies m. Not something is adding one, so it's one plus this thing. This is an and, so it's a product, so it's the product of g with s implies m, which is one plus s plus sm. And then we expand this out to get one plus g plus gs plus gsm. Y is not, not g, and not s. Okay, the not here is 1 plus. Here, not g is 1 plus g, not s is 1 plus s, and this and means we have to multiply them. So we have 1 plus 1 plus g times 1 plus s. We expand out, the ones cancel, and we just end up with g plus s plus sg. And finally, z, which is not g and not m. So the not is 1 plus. Here there's an and, so it's g times not m, which is 1 plus m. And that's 1 plus g plus gm. So here in red are the three premises now written in the algebra of Boole, so we can forget about the, the logic where it comes from now. We just have algebraic expressions that we are going to work with. So now we can illustrate our first approach, which is just to use Boole reduction. We have three premises. And so we form the product or conjunction of those premises by just multiplying them together. x times y times z. That represents the total premises of we are assuming x and we're assuming y and we're assuming z. All right, so there is our expression for x, expression for y, expression for z. And now we have to expand this out and simplify it using Boole reduction. And as I've explained, this is best done in stages. So you multiply two things together and simplify that product and then carry on. So we repeat the first term, let's say, and then we multiply these two things out and we apply the usual Boole reductions. Two of anything is zero and all exponents are rubbed off to get that this product is S plus GS plus GM. And then we have to perform another expansion and reduction to finally get S plus GS. So this is a little bit of work, okay? Uh, that's sort of the heart of the matter. That's where the actual computation sits. But it's a purely mechanical arithmetical process, which happily your computer is very, very good at, especially if it's been modified with a bit of Boole reduction technology in the uh, in the the engine, okay? So this is something that is very, very amenable to large-scale computer uh, work. So our premises have now been reduced to just S plus GS. And so the three possibilities that we're interested in are perhaps the product of the premises implies G. So then we should look at this expression, XYZ implies G. So that's S plus GS implies G. And then we express that as a 
Boole poly number. So it's 1 plus the first term, S plus GS, plus the product. And when you take the product, you get an SG and another SG, so they cancel. So the result of that is just 1 plus S plus GS. What does that tell us about this implication? Is it always true? No, it's not always true, because what we're getting here is not 1. Okay, it's not 1. It's 1 plus S plus GS. It's not equal to 1. And so, this is not a valid implication. It's not a valid logical conclusion. How about XYZ implies M? So now we have S plus GS implies M. We get 1 plus the first term plus the product MS plus GMS. And there's no cancellation here. So again, we're getting something which obviously is not equal to 1. So this is not a proper logical deduction. Finally, XYZ implies S. So here we have S plus GS implies S. Let's evaluate that. It's 1 plus the first term, S plus GS, plus the product of the two things. So S plus GS times S. Now when we do this product, the S times S is S, which cancels with that S. And the S times GS is GS, which cancels with this GS, and we do get just 1. Conclusion, Sir Galahad had better choose the stone road. That will lead him to the grail. Now I want to explain the second procedure, which is using the Boole-Mobius transform. Okay, so we have three basic propositions, S, M, G, and let's order them this way. Okay, so S, M, G. So, so G is like the first one in our, when we were doing a binary kind of ordering, this sort of would correspond to ones and this to twos and this to fours. So if we do that, then the corresponding ordering of terms would be first one and then G. Then we add M, multiply these by M, M and G, M. And then we multiply those by the next one, S. So we get S, G, S, M, S, and G, M, S. That's a natural ordering of all the terms that can appear in a Boole poly number involving these three things once you've chosen this ordering, GMS. Okay, so now we can express our three premises, X, Y, and Z, and here are the Boole poly numbers for them, in terms of this basis. Okay, so 1 plus G plus GS plus GMS. So there's one of these, there's one of those, there is one of these, and one of those. So as a vector, corresponds to 1, 1, 1 in this spot, and 1 in this spot. Zeros elsewhere corresponding to the terms which do not get involved. Y, which was G plus S plus G, S. So we have a G, we have an S, which is that one there, we have a G, S, and the rest are zeros. And Z, which is 1, there's a G right there, a GM, which is the fourth one right there, and the rest are zeros. So remember that the Boole-Mobius transform, what it does is it takes these Boole poly numbers and converts them to Boolean functions. What does that mean? It means that it allows us to quickly write down what the corresponding truth table evaluations of these premises would be if we made a big truth table for them. And the way we do that is we multiply, in this case, because there's three variables, by the Boole-Mobius transform T sub 3. Now we can be a little bit efficient about this because we want to ultimately transform not just X, Y, and Z, but also whatever conclusion we're aiming for. Now, at this stage, we are aiming potentially at three conclusions, so it makes sense to transform all of them. So the three conclusions are G, M, and S. They are potential conclusions of our argument. So here is that vector for X and Y and Z that we've just computed, and then here are the corresponding vectors for G, uh, M, and S. So G because that's the second term, M that's the third term, and S was the fifth term. So, we're going to multiply that by our Boole-Mobius transform matrix when there are three variables. It's an 8 by 8 matrix that looks like this. 
And let me remind you, there's a 4x4 four four block there, which is repeated here and here, and there's a block of zeros down there. And this block of 4 is obtained by this 2x2 two two block by repeating this 2x2 two two here, here, and here, and putting a block of zeros under there. And the 2x2 two two block is obtained by taking this 1 and repeating it here and here and putting a 0 underneath it. So it's the same pattern that generates all these Boole Mobius transform matrices. Okay, so you do the matrix multiplication. So when we do this matrix like this, then we do them all at the same time instead of doing them one by one. So we just multiply uh, this matrix by this, and then the various rows that are obtained here are the various Boole Mobius transforms of the rows over here. So this first row here is the Boole Mobius transform for X. And what does that mean? Well that means that this is the the Boolean function that you would get if you took the original expression in X with its various uh, propositional logic connectors and made a truth table for it. Okay, Then you just read down the truth table of the, of the final total expression, you would get exactly these values. So this Boole-Mobius transform is kind of circumventing the need for making an elaborate truth table. It's just going directly from the Boole polynumber to the truth table Boolean function. And there's the value for x, there's the value for y, the value for z, and the values for g, m, and s. If you look at it for a second, you'll see that the g, m, and s, uh, not surprisingly, are just sort of going through all the numbers in binary. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Because that's the way we ordered things. We ordered g to be sort of in the, in the 1's column, m to be in the 2's column, s to be in the 4's column. So, what can we do now? So, we want to uh, look at the product of the premises. Okay, so have a look now. What, we're in a very happy position now. So we can work with the information here very quickly. Because what we're interested in is this product x, y, z. And at the level of these actual Boolean function values, the operations are just multiplication point-wise. Okay? So to form the product x, y, z at this level here, we're just going to take the product of corresponding entries. And if we look at these uh, sort of columns, so that entry there, the product will be 0, 0, 0, because there's a 0 in the column. The first place where we do not get a 0 is with this column, and the other place where we do not get a 0, where you get a 1, is with this column. So when we take the product of these two things, we're going to get this vector here, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. There's a 1 only in this 5th uh, and 7th spot. Okay, now let's compare those with the values of G, M, and S. We want X, Y, Z to imply one of these things. What does that mean? It means that whenever the product is equal to 1, we want the conclusion to also be equal to 1. So we have to look in these columns only for a row which also has values 1 in those columns. So G does not have 1's, it has two zeros. M has a single 1, but the other one is a 0. But S, S is good because it has a 1 here and a 1 here. So whenever the product of the premises is true, in other words, we have a whole column of ones, then S is also true. So there's only two cases that have to be checked here. So the rest of the table is irrelevant. We're just looking for the columns where the premises are all one, and then we go down to the conclusion and see whether the entries corresponding are also equal to one. Since they are, we can deduce that X, Y, Z implies S actually is equal to one while x, y, z implies g or m is not equal to 1. So we have solved this problem with this Boole-Mobius transform, essentially by getting at the truth table values for the original expressions, but without having to go through the laborious procedure of creating the truth tables in their gory entirety. So this Boole-Mobius transform technology relies on some linear algebra, but it also relies on having these perhaps big matrices, these Boole-Mobius transform matrices like T sub 3 or or with more variables, t sub 4 and t sub 5 and so on. 
So there is a very pleasant recursive aspect to these things which we can exploit to make this actually quite a lot easier and to actually allow one to make these computations by hand without creating big matrices. So I want to show you that now. So it's an important benefit to going down this particular road. So let's have a look at the very simple kind of Boole Mobius transform. We just have a vector with two entries, say A and B, and we apply the simplest Boole Mobius transform, this matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, which we might call T1. Okay, it's with one variable. So when we do that matrix multiplication, we get A and A plus B. So it's important to appreciate this, right? The effect of this is to, we're taking this vector here, and we're copying the first entry, and the second entry is the sum of the two original entries. Okay, so now let's look at the next level where we have a T2 acting on a vector with four entries, A, B, C, D, acted on by this matrix. Well, so you do the multiplication, you get A, A plus B, A plus C, and A plus B plus C plus D. There it is there. Now, if we look at this for a second, what we can see is that this is, in some sense, uh, the same kind of thing as was uh, happening here. If we think about this four vector as actually um, a pair of two vectors, so let's say u is the vector a, b, and v is the vector c, d, then what's happening here, so u is the, is the vector uh, a, b. So if we apply uh, t1 to that, what we're getting is well, we're getting A, B, same thing we got here, we get A, A plus B, which is exactly the first part of this thing here. So this first half of it is just U times T1. Now this second part is what we get when we take U of T1 plus V of T1. Okay, so um, it's like A comma A plus B and C comma C plus D. We're taking the sum of those two things. And another way of saying that because of the linearity is that it's the vector U T1 together with U plus V times T1. So what we're doing is we're, we're taking this first vector U and this second vector V and we're adding them. Okay, so A, B plus C, D is the vector A plus C comma B plus D. And then we're applying T1 exactly like here to get this sort of second half. Okay, so the A plus C stays where it is and we have to add the A plus C to the B plus D to get A plus B plus C plus D. Okay, so that's the, the rule that UV acted on by T2 is U acted on by T1 and U plus V acted on by T1 separately. That's a lot like what's happening here. Now this procedure generalizes the same basic recursive aspect, repeats itself as we go up to higher dimensions. So the general rule is that more generally, if u and v are Boole vectors of length 2 to the n, and then we form the composite u, v, so that's a vector of length 2 to the n plus 1, then the way the Boole Mobius transform on this pair works is that you take the Tn on u and you take the Tn acting on the sum u plus v and you stick them together to form this bigger vector. Let me illustrate that by going back to our example with x. So x was originally 11000101 so let's apply T3 to that without actually creating a big matrix and doing it. Okay so if we apply this then we could think about breaking this up into two vectors of length 4. So there's 1100 times T2, that's what this says. And then over here we should take this first vector and the second vector and add them. So we're adding the vector 1100 with the vector 0101 to get 1001, 1001. And then we apply T2 to that. So we've reduced the Boole Mobius transform T3 to two separate uh, Boole Mobius transforms involving T2. Okay, so now let's sort of do that recursively. So how do we do this T3 
t2. Well, we think about splitting this vector up into two vectors, the vector 1, 1 and the vector 0, 0. And then we're going to take the first vector, 1, 1, and apply t1 to it. And the sum of the two vectors over here with t1 acting on it. So the sum of 1, 1 and 0, 0 is 1, 1. So we get 1, 1 acted on by t1. That's the first half. And then the same thing over here. We split this up into two vectors, 1, 0, 0, 1. Then apply t1 to the first one, and then also t1 to the sum of these two. So the sum is 1, 1. Okay, so what is 1, 1 acted on by t1? Well, that's just our very first formula. You get the first entry, and then the sum of the two entries, 1, 0. Here again, same thing, 1, 0. Here uh, we get the sum is, um, first one is 1, and the sum is 1. So that's one's 1, 1, and this one's the same as these ones, 1, 0. So this is a, a kind of a recursive thing. What you do is you take the vector of length 8, break it up into two vectors of length 4, and then you do that recursively, breaking that up into each one of those into two vectors of length 2, and you just keep going down. Okay, so computers are excellent at this kind of thing, okay, but you can actually do it by hand once you have a little bit of practice. So this is a technology that can be used without having to necessarily invoke big matrices in linear algebra. You can do it at the level of pencil paper calculations reasonably. So what we have here then is uh, really a complete resolution of Leibniz's dream. Okay, we've taken Boole's original approach, we've modified it, updated it a little bit, made it a little bit more modern, framed it in terms of sort of modern algebra, but it's basically Boole's original orientation. And we've used that to, well, first of all, redo the circuit analysis and logic gate story that usually employs Boolean algebra, but now also to the propositional logic scenario where we've taken the standard tools of propositional logic and basically dispensed with all of them. Dispensed with all of them and replaced them with this much more systematic, mechanical, completely routine and arithmetical resolution of this fundamental problem. In our next video, I'm going to go back to the origins of the subject, to Aristotle's syllogisms and sort of summarize how this Algebra of Boole story also sheds very nice light on what's really going on there. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.